Great. Super. So if I remember properly, we were discussing one past paper in the last class. We did two questions. The third question, the corporation tax related question was pending. That is where we stopped. Am I correct? That's where we stopped, right? Okay, let's go ahead with the requirement of this third scenario. So it has four scenarios. The scenario says, um, four questions, the scenario says at the beginning itself. The first one, calculate the net chargeable gain of Fogo Limited before any claim for group rollover relief for the year ended 30th September. So that means we are going to talk about a group. They are talking about group rollover relief. So prior to group rollover relief, what is the chargeable gain for Fogo Limited? They are asking. Are we clear with the requirement? Is the requirement to everyone? Guys. Can you guys hear me? Great. So anyone who tried this question, since we did the other questions, you knew this would be the next one that we'll be attempting today, you know? Anyone who tried this at home? No one. Fast by any chance, did you try? Okay, let's do it now. So the question carries five marks. That means how much do you have as time? Five marks means five into one point eight. Yes, you have close to nine minutes. Can you guys give a try for this one and share the answer with me on the chat? Would you give a try? What's happening today? Why everyone are very silent? Yumna, Anargi, Najat, Najat, Nafis, Ifas. Why you guys are very silent today? Exam is closed. Okay. Then only you need to speak more to share the knowledge and try to improve the knowledge. Uh, by the way, can I know who has joined as uh, Mr. Dot underscore Miss Dot underscore at 16? Right. Can you guys give this one a try? Then we can discuss. Quickly, can you guys try this?
Great. So your time starts now. Nine minutes. Give it a try.
Okay, guys, uh, how is the C2? Was anyone able to complete the answer? Anyone who was able to complete? All right, let's walk through the scenario then. Fogo Limited has 100% subsidiary Neta Limited. Fine. About Fogo Limited, during the year ended 30th September, Fogo Limited made the following capital disposals. On 31st October 2019, Fogo Limited sold an investment property which had been let out to tenants since it was acquired. So from the inspection, it has been rented. Investment property was sold to an unconnected company for £625,000. Okay, so the buyer who we sold is also out of the company. Correct? Right. Then uh, it had cost £500,000 when it was acquired in February 2010. So in Feb, they have acquired it. It has uh, cost them £500,000. On 4th May, Fogo Limited sold a freehold warehouse which it had used exclusively in its trade. The warehouse was sold to an unconnected company for £560,000. It had cost Fogo Limited £100,000 when it was acquired in September 2001. On 19th September 2020, Fogo Limited sold 4% shareholding in an unconnected trading company, resulting in a capital loss of £25,000. Indexation factors are also given. We need to calculate the chargeable gains. So we have around three disposals, right? So, based on these, we need to calculate the overall chargeable gain for the company. Starting from first one, investment property. So, we have the purchase cost, we have the sales price. And do we need to grant indexation allowance for the first one? Is the indexation allowance applicable for the first sale or the first disposal? Guys, can you guys recall the indexation allowance? It is not applicable. I got one answer. The others, what are your thoughts? Is the indexation allowance applicable for here? Guys, okay, let's move on. I would say yes, because agree the disposal is happening on 2019, but indexation is based on the purchase date, right? It was purchased in Feb 2010, which is prior to 2017. So we can grant indexation allowance for this one. Sales proceed 625,000. We have to take that. Then we have to deduct cost 500,000 from that, which leads to 125,000. So I did that part here. 625,000 
minus 500,000, 125,000 would be the gear, what you call the gain. That is without the indexation. Then indexation factor from 2010 February would be 0. 0.269. I applied that 0. 0.269 on 500,000, which lead to an indexation allowance of 134,500. Now, if I grant this entire amount, I will end up with a refund, 9,500. HMRC has to pay me. Can indexation allowance create a refund? Is it uh, possible? Can an indexation allowance create a refund? Indexation allowance should not create a refund. Yes, it should not create a refund. So if that is not supposed to create a refund, the maximum amount of indexation allowance that I can claim would be how much? 125,000 itself. So as a result, my chargeable gain is going to be zero in respect of this investment property. So first part is the question is done. Are we clear with how we derived on the answer? Any questions? Great. Then second property. It's a freehold warehouse used excessively for trade. Sold to 560,000 pounds. 100,000 is the cost uh, purchased in 2001. Same procedure. Took the sales proceeds. Minus the cost. Apply the indexation allowance. So in this case, indexation factor would be 0.593. So I applied 0.593 on 100,000 which comes to six, uh, 59,300. 460,000 minus 59,300. The chargeable gain is going to be 400,700 pounds. Are we clear with that? The warehouse, is it okay? Great. Finally, we comes to shares. For shares, can we consider the indexation allowance? Can we consider the indexation? I would say we don't know because the acquisition dates and all are not given. So we can't come to a conclusion. We just have to take the loss amount that they have given. We have to trust their calculation for the time being. Because we don't have data on when they have purchased or anything. We just know the uh, date of the sale. So with that, we cannot come to a conclusion whether indexation is claimable or not. Whatever the loss they have given, we have to assume that is after considering all the factors. Are we good? Great. So then first one, no gain. Second one, 400,700 gain. Third one, 25,000 loss. As a result, prior to reliefs, net chargeable gain is 375,700. Are we clear? Great. Then let's move on to the next question. Okay. It has two parts. In respect of disposal of Fogo Limited of its freehold warehouse on 4th May 2020. That means this one. 
give two reasons why Fogo Limited can make a group rollover relief claim and explain which of the Neta Limited's asset acquisitions will be qualified and which will not qualify as a replacement asset. Right. Can you try that part first? Four minutes. Four minutes means how long you can take? Four marks means 7.2 minutes. So within seven minutes, we have to conclude. Can you guys try that part? Great. So you have seven minutes. Develop a proper answer, assuming this is the exam itself. And I hope, as usual, you guys have logged into the practice platform and answering inside the practice, uh, practice platform itself. Am I correct? Great. So try one of part B. Give a try. You guys have around seven minutes for that.
Okay, guys, uh, time is up. How's the situ? Was anyone able to construct an answer for this one? Guys, anyone who was able to construct an answer for this question? You are there, right? Okay, all right. Shares are not qualifying business assets. Okay. For rollover relief, okay. All right, let's uh, talk about Neta Limited as well. For the year ended 30th September 2020, Neta Limited plant and machinery is qualified. All right, okay, let's see. For the year ended 30th September 2020, Neta Limited has a draft tax adjusted trading profit of 180,000 pounds. The figure has been calculated correctly but not included the interest payable or receivable. Okay. On 1st October 2019, Neta Limited borrowed 1 million pounds from a bank at an annual interest rate of 5%. During the year ended 30th September 2020, the interest payable of 50,000 was in respect of the full week. So we have been given up with a breakup of the interest payable. Interest on 550,000 pounds of the loan to acquire fixed plant and machinery for use in its factory. The fixed plant and machinery has an expected useful lifetime of 15 years. Okay. Interest on 450,000 pounds of loan to acquire 3% shareholding in a trading company called Juna. So I got one answer from Arun Tethi. The others, what are your thoughts? What do you guys think? Yumna, any idea? Plant and equipment qualified. Okay, all right. So, guys, you are getting four marks, right? To get four marks, we have to write something properly. First point we have to write is, Neta is a 100% owned subsidiary of Fogo. Therefore, group rollover relief can be considered. Then we have to discuss about the assets that Neta Limited has acquired. So, Two assets are there, flick, uh, fixed plant and machinery. We can say fine. Fixed plant and machinery is qualifying for group ROR. Uh, 550,000 uh, 550, pounds is the amount. 
what they have received is 560,000. Okay, fine. That part we can say. So, few points. One, why the group rollover relief is coming into the picture? So, we have to clearly say, Neta is a fully owned subsidiary of Fogo. Therefore, at group level, we can consider the ROR. Point number one. Point number two, we have to check what are the assets acquired by Neta during the period. So we have one fixed plant and machinery. So we have to explain, okay, fixed plant and machinery is qualifying for ROR. Since Neta is a fully owned subsidiary of Fogo, yes, this plant and machinery qualifies for group ROR. Same thing we need to interpret about the shares. Shares are not qualifying, therefore, for shares, they cannot claim group ROR. These three points we need to explain because they are allowing four marks. If we just say, okay, fine, uh, the plant and machinery qualifies, we are at trouble. We need to write something to get four marks. Are we clear? These three points we have to write. Great. Then the next part, if you guys, are you guys okay with the part one? Can I move on to part two? Or do we have any concerns about part uh, one still? Right, then let's move on to part two. Calculate the amount of the gain which can be deferred if a claim for group rollover relief is made and explain when the deferred gain will become chargeable. So you have three marks. Three marks means three into 1.8. Five minutes. Can you try? Part two. Can you try to get into answer? Great. So you got five minutes. Give it a try.
All right, guys, time is up. I got only one answer. The others, what is the C2? Anyone else who tried? Can I have a look at on the answer? All right, let's go to the calculation then. I got the chargeable gain, which is we already calculated in the previous part. 400,700 pounds. We have received 560,000 pounds. But if we go for this plant and machinery, the reinvestment is only 550,000. That means 10,000 less. So that unrelieved amount we have to consider against the gain. Out of that, we take the lower as the taxable gain. So 470,000, the actual gain compared against the unreinvested amount of 10,000, unreinvested amount is the lower. So that will become taxable. The balance part from the gain can be deferred. So that would be 390,700. So Arunthati, your answer was correct. Good job. Any further questions on this part from anyone? Are we good or do we have any questions? The others, are we okay or do you, do you have any questions? Nafis, are we good? Great. Then let's move on to the next part. Calculate the taxable total profits of Neta Limited for the year ended 30th September. Note, your calculation should commence with the draft tax adjusted trading profit of £180,000, clearly adjusting for the trading interest payable and showing the non-trade loan relationship income. Three marks are given. So again, five minutes you can spend. Would you guys give a try for this one as well? Great. So five minutes, give it a try.
All right, guys. Uh, time is up. Anyone who tried? Anyone who was able to come up with the answer? No one. So you all are still attempting or couldn't attempt. Uh, let's skip this question, Razi, because uh, this is the last part of this question. Uh, we'll start from the next uh, fresh question for you. Are you okay? Attempting. All right. Okay. Let's have a discussion then. So we discussed up to interest payable part. Let's have a quick discussion on interest receivable part as well. Neta Limited's financial statement for the year ended 30th September 2020 showed interest receivable from investments 35,000 pounds, of which 25,000 was received during the year and 10,000 was accrued. There was no accrual brought forward on uh, 1st October 2019. Okay, fine. So I start with as they requested. the 180,000 draft profit. Then whatever business related interest I have to adjust. This machine, interest related to this machine is a business related one, right? So for that I can deduct the interest from my trading income itself. So the interest is 550,000 uh, 50, pounds at a rate of 5%. and yeah so i just you you have two options either use five percent and try or we know the total interest so i take the long route total interest is fifty thousand pounds agree do you guys agree on that Right. Then total borrowing. Total borrowing is we know one million. Out of that. Business borrowing is how much? That is 550,000. Yes, correct. Then I take the proportion. Out of 1,550,000 means this divided by this. That means if I convert as a percentage, 55%. Then 55% of this interest is attributable for the, what you call the business component. That is 27,500, which I deducted from here, from my trading income. Are we clear that part? I took the total accrued interest. Then I took the business proportion. Based on the business proportion, I splitted the accrued interest. Simply, I took my overall interest cost, accrued part. Right. The overall interest is 500, uh, sorry, 50,000 pounds. Then if I am to split this between the business one and the non-business one, we need to figure out the proportion, the business proportion. Total borrowing is 
the 1 million pounds out of that 1 million 550000 is to purchase a business asset the balance 450000 is to acquire shares and investment so the business component is only 550000 are we agreeing on that Can't we take it directly from 550,000? Uh, can do. You can do that as well. Yeah. So what Raj is saying is 550,000, we know the interest rate 5%. So just multiply 550,000 by the interest rate. Can do. That also can do. But I am not using that here because uh, assume the loan is taken in two different periods. Then we might be in trouble. Certain exam questions, they might not dis uh, disclose the interest percentage. Then we might be in trouble. Therefore, I'm using this business proportion model. But yes, this question has all the data that we need. So if we want, we can go ahead with the 550,000 into the rate as well. Have you okay, Razi? Great. So coming back to the Arundhati's question, 550,000 is the business proportion we agreed. Then we take the percentage. So 550,000 divided by 100 to 1 million the percentage of that would be 55%. Are we agreeing on that as well? Great. Then the total borrowing cost, we multiplied by the business proportion, 55%, which comes to 27,500. Are we okay now? Great. So I took 27,500 here. The interest received part, anyway, we have to consider as a other income, a different source of income, I would say. So this would be the only adjustment that we have to take against the, what do you call the uh, trading income. So as a result, my tax adjusted trading profit would be 152,500. Are we agreeing on that as well? Awesome. Then I take the interest income separately. So we anyway go by the accrual basis, right? So if the accrual amount is fine, nothing to worry for us. We just take the 35,000 because this is a corporate. So interest will be taken on accrual basis. So I took 35,000. Are we clear with 35,000 why I took as well? Great. Then the balance interest component. From 50,000, we already took 27,500 for the trading income. The balance 22,500, I am using the loan relationship rule and setting off against my interest income. As a result, my taxable uh, interest income would be 12,500. Are we agreeing on that as well? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So my final TTP, taxable total profit would be 165,000 pounds. We are good? That is what they're asking, right? So we answered to this entire question as well. So now we did a past paper question, an entire paper from section C. What is your thought about where we stand? Before I move on to the next paper.
was it hard for you all or was it uh, average or were you guys comfortable what do you think okay one answer i got as hard the others Guys, can I have the answer, please? Silent means yes. Uh, not really. When it comes to exam questions, the number of adjustments that we need to remember is less. Compared to the number of adjustments that we have, uh, that, that we had to remember in the questions that we did in the classroom. So these are not lengthy questions because, as I always say, take one requirement at a time. Don't go through the entire scenario at once. Take first requirement, then start reading the scenario. Obviously, first two paras will be based on the, I mean, first. So requirement will be based on the first two, what you call requirements. So then you don't need to memorize the entire scenario. First part, finishing. Second uh, part of the scenario, read the requirement, come back to the scenario, read the balance. You would be good with that. Likewise, take one requirement at a time. Then you don't have to memorize a lot. Naja, are we okay? Ah, right. So when you see a big scenario, don't get panic. Your focus should not be this side, not the left side. Your focus should be the right side. That is where the requirement is. Our concern is only the requirement. Take one by one. First scenario, did it had... 10 adjustments to be done, even though we have a lengthy scenario. No, right? Maximum three adjustments was there. Three assets, three adjustments. So, is it lengthy then? Just because the question is lengthy, what you have to do, is it a lengthy work? The rest is also like that, guys. So that is where we uh, made the mistake. Just because the scenario seems like a heavy one, we just get panic. Don't be. However length the scenario is, they can put only questions up to 15 marks max. They cannot go beyond that. No. Because there is a specific structure that they have instructed. This is the paper structure. So they have to stick to that structure. Maximum, they can put only 15 marks. That means what? One adjustment per mark, even if they put maximum 15 adjustments would be there, but they won't do that as well. To get this 15, did we do 15 adjustments? No, less than that. That means the number of adjustments is not the concern. Take one requirement at a time, address that requirement. That would save you a lot of time. Plus, it will help you to boost your confidence as well because you are thinking at one at a time. So you don't keep a lot of things in the memory. You don't have to go through the scenario again and again to answer the questions. Are we good? Right, so I hope you are this question, uh, where to read, I answered the question. Am I correct, Arundhati, or that is not answered yet? Right. Okay, then let's move on to another paper. So I'm closing this one.
Now let's check a pre mock. We will go to June 2024 pre mock. Shall we? Because that includes all three sections. What we did was a past paper which only had uh, section C. Now let's move on to a full paper where we have all three sections. Shall we move on to pre mock? June 2024. Shall we give it a try? Great. So from here, just assign the mock like we did for the previous one. Can you guys assign and let me know before I open the paper? Just go here. Take a UK. ACC official resources. Practice exams under that. Uh, June 2024 should be there. Wait, wait, sorry. Okay, why is it not appearing there? Can you guys see the June 2024 mock? Okay. Why is that? Only the September one is there. Okay, I'll check what has happened there. Uh, for the time being, let's move on to another, what do you call the, uh, but actually apart from section uh, B, uh, A and B, we can go for C. Okay, let's go for another paper itself. Shall we assign this one? September, December 2022, 2023. Great. Assign that and open it. Let me know once you have opened. Awesome. Everyone has opened the paper. Anyone missed or still opening? Right. Let me know once the paper is open, then we can start. Are we okay? Can we start? Right. As usual, let's go ahead with the requirements, not the scenario. We are going to start with the requirements again. Advice, Alicia, of the income tax and the national insurance contribution implications for the tax year if she is provided with a company motor car. Note, your answer should be supported by appropriate calculations. As Alicia is a higher rate taxpayer, you can use a working at the marginal approach. That means you can try to get the gap and do the calculation. However, a full computation approach is equally acceptable 
you are not expected to consider any implications for the task limited. Requirement, is it clear, this part? Right, so it carries three marks. That means, again, we can spend around five minutes. Am I correct? Great. Can we give a try for this one within five minutes? Awesome. So your time starts now. Give a try for this one. And please share the answer in the chat with me.
All right, guys, uh, time is up, but it's a C2. Anyone who attempted? Anyone who's trying to attempt? Okay, let's go ahead then. You should assume today's date is uh, 28th March. Alicia is employed by Task Limited and is currently paid a gross annual salary of £60,000. She is therefore a higher rate taxpayer. Alicia does not have any other income. Task Limited has offered Alicia the choice of either being provided with a company motor car or alternatively receiving a salary increase and also being paid a mileage allowance for using her private motor car for business journeys. So we have two options. One, either take a car or take a salary and claim the mileage allowance. Regardless of which alternative is chosen, Alicia's new remuneration package will be effective from 6th April and will apply throughout the tax year. So, first alternative, that is the one that they have asked the question as well. Company motor car. The motor car will be petrol powered with a list price of 22,400. It will have an official CO2 emission rate of 55 grams per kilometer. Task Limited will not provide Alicia with any fuel for private journeys. Under this alternative, Alicia will not run a private motor car. So that is enough to answer for part A. Are we clear on the scenario for part A? Are we clear on the scenario? Great. So, will this have an impact on the income tax of uh, Alicia? Yes. What is the impact? What would be the impact that is coming to the what do you call the uh, income tax? Very simple, guys. By the car benefit amount, the taxable income will go up. That means car benefit amount into the higher rate, which is 40%. Income tax will also go up. Agree or not? A car is given by the employer means we have to calculate the car benefit. By the car benefit amount, her taxable income will go up. Once the taxable income goes up, uh, that amount, car benefit amount into the higher rate, since she is a higher rate taxpayer, that amount into higher rate will be the increase in the income tax. Agree or not? Exactly, 40%. Right. Will this has an impact on Alicia's NIC? Partially correct, Razi. So, it's not exempted, but... Alicia is liable to pay only class 1 employee contribution. Whereas, non-cash benefits are not considered for class 1 employee contribution. So, for Alicia, there will not be any NIC impact if she chooses the company motor car option. Are we clear? Then let's do the maths and see where we stand. 
So it's a very straightforward one, guys. We have the list price. I took that 22,400, this one. And they have made it very simple. They are saying it's a petrol car. And the CO2 emission is also, they have given 55 grams per kilometer. Very straightforward. Man. So if it is 55 grams per kilometer, the rate would be 16. Agreed? Uh, what is based on mileage, Razi? Sorry, I didn't follow your question. Uh, no, car benefit will be calculated based on mileage only if we are talking about the mileage allowance that is where she uses her own car. But here she is provided with a company car in first option. So if a company car is given, we go by the CO2 emission. Or if it is an electric car, we go by the electric mileage. Are we good? Right. So I took the rate as 16%. So 22,400 into 16% would be 3,584. By this amount, the taxable income will go up. So this into 40%, she, since she is already a higher rate taxpayer, this total benefit into 40% would be the growth in her income tax. So 3,584 into 40% is 1,434. That is the increase in income tax. For NIC, we just need to elaborate. For Alicia, there is no NIC impact. For task limited, yes. But we are computing from the Alicia's point of view so far. Are we okay? Any queries or clarifications about this calculation? We are okay or any questions, guys? Suppose if he is a basic rate taxpayer. Yes. So whatever the base he is, I mean, if he is an additional rate taxpayer, anyway, nothing to worry. Apply 45%. If he is a basic rate or a higher rate taxpayer, we have to check with, uh, so he, they have given, right? 60,000 is her annual salary. So whether that plus the new benefit whether it exceeds the band if that doesn't happen nothing to worry you can apply the respective rate are you okay Arundhati? right then we are moving on to the next part uh, okay it's 7 30 i think you guys usually ask for a break around this time right Razi? Okay. Uh, how long will it take, Razi? Right. Okay. Let's take 10 minutes. I'll give you 10 minutes break. But be back. Huh? Guys, these past papers, don't take it lightly. We need to do papers. We need to practice it. There is no excuse for that. So don't take this paper session slightly. Take it more serious than the theory sessions. So yes, let's take the 10 minutes break. Then we will start on the rest. All right, guys. How's the C2? Was anyone able to complete? Can I check the answers? Anyone able to complete it?
Are you guys attempting or not attempting? What is easy to? All right. So shall we start discussing or you guys need more time? All right. Let's see. So now I'm going to the second part. That is salary plus a mileage allowance. Alicia will receive an annual gross, uh, gross salary increase of 10,000 pounds. Task Limited will also pay Alicia mileage allowance of 45 pennies per mile. Even she uses her private motor car for business journeys. Alicia drove 8,000 miles in the performance of her duties for Task Limited during the tax year. Her annual motor car running cost will be 6200 higher if she uses her own car for both business and private journey compared to using of her company car. So our requirement is figure out the national insurance and income tax impact. So basically, taxable income will go up by 10,000. That is clearly evident because a gross salary is increasing by 10,000. So if that is the case, definitely taxable income will go up by 10,000. That we agree. Right. So my age allowance, what will happen? We have to do our usual maths. So the HMRC limit against what she get. Yes, gap will be taxable, but do we have a gap? Seems like no gap. Because up to first 10,000 miles, HMRC limit is also 45 pennies and what the employer has given is also 45 pennies, isn't it? Correct? Right. So let's move on to the calculation and see. Salary, yes, by 10,000 it in uh, increases. Mileage allowance, like I said, no impact because whatever HMRC limit is, that amount only the company has paid. So 45 to 45 set it off, it will become zero. So the incremental uh, cost or the income for Alicia would be 10,000 pounds only, only the basic salary. Do we agree on that? Right. So 10,000 into 40% would be her impact on the income tax liability. That is also clear. Great. And I see what will happen. What will happen for NIC? We will have to check the rate. So her salary is anyway above 60,000. So she will be coming under the second category. So 2%. Isn't it 2, Razi? It will be 2, right? Because her salary is already more than 50,270. 
if so whatever additional income comes will be at the third stage which is applicable with 2% Razi are we good right so this will be at 2% NIC will increase by 200. So, this is the answer for three marks. Was it tough? So, we already did for six marks. Both of them were not tough, right? Let's see the last part as well. Advise Alicia as to which of the two alternative remuneration packages is the most beneficial to her. Clarify showing details from the scenario in your workings. So now we have to advise her financially which one is better for her. This carries 4 marks. So 4 marks means 4 into 1.8. You have 7 minutes. Can you try this one? This don't need seven minutes, but you have seven. Can you guys give a try? Great. So your time starts now. Try to do this within seven minutes and please share the answers with me. Guys, today the number of answers I'm getting is the yeah, answers and the responses. Both are very low. So try to be a little bit interactive. This is the latter part of our whole program. It's very close to the exam now. So try to be, you know, a little bit interactive as we used to be. Right. Go ahead, guys.
All right, guys, uh, time is up. I received one answer. The others, what is the situation? Done or attempting or what's happening? All right, let's give a try. So what am I going to do here is to see what kind of an incremental will happen if I go to this option. 10,000 salary is coming. Income tax increment is 4,000. Plus NIC increment is 200. Not just that, there is an incremental running cost also, this one. So, 6,200. And she will receive the mileage allowance. So, the net cash impact is 3,200. That is what she is getting. So, if she go for the company car, what will happen? She gets a car, but she has to pay income tax as well. Then which one is more beneficial for him? Her. So I agree. If I compare only the tax amounts, getting the company car seems to be more lucrative because the tax amount would be less. But... From Alicia's point of view, what she has to think is what will happen to her cash flow, right? Even after setting after the income tax, if she has a net cash flow here, a positive one in taking the salary, compared to getting a car and paying a tax where she doesn't even get a cash benefit, which would be more better for her? company car or the additional salary with the mileage allowance, which seems to be overall better, cash flow wise. Mm, how can the company car would be better? Second alternative is better, okay. So guys, I'm re-explaining. Uh, they are not asking for what is more beneficial for tax purpose. They are asking what is more beneficial for Alicia. From Alicia's point of view, if she go for the first option, the company car, she will get a car which she will have to hand over anyway when she leaves the job. Without any cash inflow, she will have to pay a tax. But if she go for the second option where she gets a mileage allowance and the increase in the salary, she has a net cash flow benefit even after setting off all the taxes, income tax, NIC, both, and the additional car running cost as well. After setting off all those, still she has a positive cash benefit then what would be more beneficial for Alicia? Second option seems to be more benefited for her, right? But yes, if they make a slight change in this requirement, like, so here they are saying which alternative is more beneficial for her, rather than saying that if they say what package is more beneficial for income tax, then the entire answer would be other way around. Isn't it? Great. So be careful with the requirement. They are not asking what is the most tax benefited method. They are asking what is the most benefited method overall to Alicia. 
if that is the case, additional salary and the mileage allowance is more lucrative. Agreed? All right. Okay. The next one, guys, is a one lengthy calculation. So, two options we tried today or next class. Right. Everyone okay to go ahead today? Okay. So you want to practice it today and discussion also today, right? Okay. So it's 12 marks. So if I allow you to practice separately, 12 into 1.8. So we will have to give for 20 minutes. So straight away, shall we go for the discussion then? Is that okay for everybody? Great. Then let's straight away move on to the discussion. So first requirement, calculate DOM's income tax liability for the tax year. Note, your computation should include all of the items referred to in the notes, indicating by the use of zero, any items which are not taxable or not deductible. So if there is no impact, you have to go with the zero, like I always say. Let's walk through the scenario. So in this kind of a case where you have a full calculation, don't read the scenario once, then start the calculation separately and do the things uh, one at a time. While reading the scenario itself, start doing the adjustments. Clear? Don't read, then come back and do the calculations again. While reading, do the maths. We are good? Right. So I'm just telling you guys few mechanisms that we can use to manage the time. So try to use those techniques so that we can finish everything within the stipulated time. On 31st July, Dom left his employment with Abacus Limited where he had worked since 2019. Dom started a new employment with Brass Limited on 1st August. The following information available in respect of Dom's employment in the tax year. So he has worked with two employers. Both we have to calculate separately and add it together. We are okay with that? Great. Starting with Abacus. Dom was paid a gross annual salary of 64,800 when employed by Abacus. So what should we do now? What is the adjustment we need to take here? Yes, we need to prorate the salary. It is an annual salary that they have given. He has not been working with Abacus for the entire year. In the middle, he is leaving. So this 64,800 we need to proportionate. So he has left only on July end. So that means April, May, June, July. For four months, he has worked with Abacus during the tax year. So 64,800 divided by 12 into 4. Clear? Right. Then, on 15th May 2021, Abacus gave Dom a briefcase costing 100 as a reward for passing a professional exam. 
what should we do for that? What should be the adjustment coming for that? Give me one second, guys. Sorry, guys. So uh, this briefcase gifted by the employer, the abacus, what should we do? Can you recall something called trivial benefits? We discussed under the exempted employment income. It's exempted. There is NIC for those rewards. Okay, so what is the limit for trivial benefit? So guys, it's a revision. So if you cannot recall, go to the handout and check. All right. So there is no harm. Go back to the handout and checking at this point. So if you are not sure, go back, check. Yes, it's 250. So this one is less than 250. It's a trivial one because it's not given for work-related thing as well. So yes, we can exempt. I agree. Third one, during the tax year, Tom draw 900 miles on Abacad Limited's company business using his private motor car. Abacus Limited reimbursed him for this mileage at a rate of 35 pennies per mile. So what will happen now? Do we have a taxable benefit here? Is there a taxable benefit in this case? Yes, it is not a taxable benefit but it is going to be an allowable deduction. Why? Because HMRC limit would be 45 pennies here, but company has paid only 35. So 10 pennies into 900 miles, that amount would be a taxable benefit, uh, allowable deduction. Agree? Right, give me one minute to plug the charger, guys. All right, that's all about Abacus. Are we okay with Abacus? Any questions on the calculation for Abacus Limited? Right, then let's move forward with the next one, Brass Limited. Dom was paid a gross annual salary of 76,800 once employed by Brass. Again, we need to proportion it. This is also an annual salary. So 76,800 divided by 12 into 8. Agree? Uh, why 8? 
because up to July he is working with Abacus, right? So from August only he would be joining Brass. Right. On 1st September, he was provided with a new diesel powered company motor car. The motor car has a list price of 25,200 pounds and an official CO2 emission rate of 122 grams per kilometer. The motor car does not meet the real driving emission, that means RDE2 standard. So it's not meeting with the standard. So simply we need to calculate the car benefit and proportionate that also for the number of months. It is given on September. So September means September, October, November, December, Jan, Feb, March. Only seven months. Agree? Great. Dom was provided with fuel for private use in respect of the motor car. Simple. We anyway calculate the appropriate percentage when we are calculating for the car benefit. Multiply that by the fixed component. So fixed component you can figure out from the tax rate tables itself. So that will be here. So for fuel, 27,800 multiplied by whatever the rate comes from our calculation. Agree? Awesome. Then, Brass Limited has a workplace nursery on its premises, which is available to all employees. And Dom's child took up a place there on 1st Jan. Dom does not pay anything in respect of this nursery place. Although the nursery fee is payable by members to the public, members of the public for any available places are 700 pounds per month. So what will happen here? What is the point that we are trying to touch here? Only 500 pounds is exempted. Okay. Uh, what is the 500 pounds limit? What is the exemption we are talking about here? Under which exemption category are we trying to claim? Okay, I got another answer as exempted. Under which category are we trying to claim the exemption now? Can you recall we had something called workplace nurseries? Under the tax exempted scheme? Right. So what does the workplace nursery story say? It is exempted, right? Workplace nurseries are exempted. So this one we can exempt. Are we good? Uh, Razi, are we okay? Right. So that would be an exempted benefit. During the tax year, Dom paid 300 to renewal of his membership of a professional body. 
the professional membership is a requirement of his employment by brass. Now, what do we do? A professional membership fee. What should we do now? Yes. Uh, for the, uh, this one, we can simply deduct from the employment income because it is required to perform the work and if it is relevant for the work we can allow the professional subscription fees are we good right then other sources of income he has a savings income of 700 and a dividend income of 3000 plus he has made a donation to a charity 240 that is net so now we know what needs to be done we discussed everything shall we just plug the numbers and see not for work then we ah yes now let's say you are an accountant and you are claiming a marketing related professional subscription then we can't allow it to be deducted isn't it Right. So let's try to plug the numbers. Okay. Give me a second, guys. I was thrown out of the system. Right, so since he has the dividend and the interest, I use the usual tabular format. So abacus, I'm calculating separately. So we had 64,800 divided by 12 into 4. Gift, 100, we can exempt. Mileage allowance, 90. That means 900 miles into 35 minus 45, which is 90. So 21,510 would be the total income received from Abacus. Agreed? Right. Then brass. Salary, six, uh, 76,800 divided by 12 into 8. Car benefit, I gave a working. Let's move on to the working. List price, 25,200. It does not meet the standard. That means the starting point is 20%. Agree with that? Starting point, 20%. Do you guys agree with that? Great. Then the CO2 emission is 122. Excess over and above 55 would be 67. 67 into 5 slots, that means 13 slots. 20 plus 13 means 33. So total benefit would be 25,200 into 33%, which would be 8,417. But this was only given from September. So we have to calculate only for seven months. So five months component, I took it out. The taxable part would be only 4,910. Are we okay? Right. Then this 4,910, I map to the main calculation. Then private fuel, I give a working, but without a working also, you can go ahead with the calculation.
amount we took as 27,800. So I take it as 27,800. Percentage appropriate rate we already calculated 33. So 27,800 into 33 would be 9,285. But this is also coming into the picture only for seven months. So five months component I have to take out. Once I take out my taxable component for fuel would be only 5,416. Are we good? Great. So that also I take to the mainframe. I take it here. The nursery we discussed, there is no benefit. Membership we deducted. That's all from employment income, right? Agree? Great. So, from brass, the overall employment income is 61,226. That plus what he received from Abacus, 21,510. The overall employment income would be 82,736. We are agreeing on that as well. Awesome. Then I took the interest income 700 and dividend income 3000. So which led to a total non-savings taxable income of, sorry, total non-savings income of 82,730. From that, I deducted the personal allowance, which is leading to a taxable non-savings income of 70,166 and a taxable savings of 700 a taxable dividend of 3000. We are clear? Right. Then it's about applying the rates. So again, we have a gift aid donation coming into the picture. For that, I gave another working number. 37,700 is my usual basic rate band. Donation 240 is the net one. So that divided by 80 into 100, 300. So the extended basic rate band would be 38,000. That should be clear, right? Any concerns about the extension of the basic rate band? Great. Then this 38,000 I take to my tax calculation. That into 20%. The balance 32,166 at 40%. Then savings income. Dom is a higher rate taxpayer. As a result, the savings income nil rate band would be only 500 pounds. So that at 0%, the balance 200 at 40%. Agree? Great. Then dividend income. Nil rate band would be 1000. The balance 2000 taken by the higher rate which is 33,075. Agree? Yes, savings nil rate band depends on the total taxable income. So, basically, whether the taxpayer is a higher rate or an additional rate or a basic rate taxpayer. In this case, the taxable income is only 73,866. That means DOM is a higher rate taxpayer. As a result, I gave only 500 pounds for savings income nil rate band. 
uh, no, not the net income. We go based on the taxable income because what we are trying to say is depending on whether he is a basic rate taxpayer or a higher rate taxpayer or an additional rate taxpayer only, the impact will come. We are okay? Right. So once I adjust the dividend income also, the total income tax liability will be 21,221 for DOM. Uh, no, dividend nil rate band is 1,000. I took as 1,000, right? Rasi, are we okay? Uh, Razi, are we good? I took only 1000 under the nil rate ban, balance 2000 under the higher rate ban. All right. So that's all what we need to do to get 12 marks. Are we okay? Any questions on this full calculation? Any concerns or any doubts that you have? Silence means no doubts or silence means uh, everything is a doubt. If suppose we did any wrong in starting calculation, ah uh, no, not really, because uh, actually marking schemes are also available in the portal. You can just check how they have awarded the marks. So if you make a mistake at the beginning, you will only lose for that area, I mean that line, and the tax calculation. That's it. For the other adjustments, you will get the full marks because in ACCA. Generally, for the final answer, they don't allocate marks. It will be always for steps in section C. Yes, tax calculation will be impacted. There you might lose some marks, but that is it. The rest you will get the full marks. Oh. Uh, so what we are trying to do, Razi, is this is a past paper, but we cannot calculate based on the past data. No? So the past paper numbers, we are trying to do based on the current tax year's provision. So for the current tax year, dividend income nil rate band is 1000. That is why we are using 1000. Are you okay? So the whole calculation is based on the current year tax provisions because past papers, we don't have any other option. They haven't changed the past papers. Razi, are we okay? Okay, let me clear out this part, guys. Uh, I told last week also, when it comes to taxation, when we move on to the past papers, unfortunately, ACCA haven't changed the tax years. So the tax years are as the past paper itself. But from our end, there is no use on practicing the question based on the previous tax years provisions. So what we are trying to do is the given factors, we assume that is for the 2023-2024 tax year. So based on the provisions applicable for 2023-2024 only, we will be doing the calculation. 
So even in the previous questions, the previous paper also we did, NIC was 3.25 in that particular tax year. But we did it for 2%, the current tax year's provisions. So that is a common issue when it comes to tax because they are not changing the marking schemes, they are not changing the past papers. So what we can do is assume the tax years as today's tax years and go ahead with the calculation based on the current tax year provisions. Exactly. So uh, scroll down to the car benefit. All right. So this is the car benefit. Any queries around here, Yumna? Uh, in the exam, that is fine for section C because we are using the spreadsheet, no? So in that, not a problem. But if it is a section A or B question, you have to round down to 33. Are we good? Right. Uh, Arunthati, Razi, uh, have I addressed the questions that you guys have raised? Or anything pending from my end on the queries you guys raised? Great. So NIC one, I want you guys to try as a homework. So when we start the next class, I expect answers from everyone on this part B. Can we do that? Great. So try it not as straightforward as you see, just because it's two marks. Don't think they will make your life easy. This one is not as straightforward as you think. But try to do the calculation. And in the next class, we will have a discussion on this whole NIC story. Okay. Any further questions for today? No problem at all. So guys, then let's wind up at this point for today. If you don't have any further queries, we'll catch up on the next class. For theory, guys, we have the Thursday class. So if you want, you can physically attend the class as well. Uh, for revision, next Tuesday, we have the next revision. All right, then let's wind up at this point. Thanks a lot for everyone for the participation. Let's catch up on the next class. See you guys then. Have a nice week. Good night.